All right. Whew. All right. Uh, if you could open up to Psalm 79 and uh, follow along in that psalm with me. Psalm 79, uh, verses 1 through 13. This is a psalm that, that some have said we probably shouldn't read in church. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I've heard it said that we shouldn't sing that last song in church. It's just too dark. Do we want to talk about God ruining us? Let's read this and we'll unpack why it's so important. I'm really, really hot, Mike. If you could stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 79 says, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food. The flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors. Mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you. And on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Verse 8. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us. For we are brought very low. Help us, O God. Help us, O God, of our salvation. For the glory of your name deliver us. And atone for our sins, for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Father, even the hard words of the scripture are for our good Every word of scripture is for our good. Lord, help us to see why this is such a good word for us today, for me today, for everyone in the pew today, for everyone watching this from afar today. Let us see how your wrath and your anger is a holy wrath and a holy anger. And let us see from this psalm that talks so much of your wrath being poured out, let us see from this psalm also your mercy and your grace. If it were not for your mercy and your grace, Lord, if, if, if you were to count our iniquities against us, none of us could stand. So Lord, help us to see your mercy and grace here. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. And whoever's got the mic control, if you could turn me down a little bit more. I'm echoing in my ears. All right. They're big ears, so that might be why. But, um, if you look at this psalm, um, and you've been with us through this series on the psalms, then I'm going to bring up something that if you've been here, you've heard me say before. This is one of the psalms that... People throughout history have said, well, maybe, maybe this should be flagged as inappropriate. Maybe this psalm should be left out of prayer books. 
If, if you uh, have been with us, you know that, that when the, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church was, was decreeing what should and should not be in what they call their Book of the Hours, their Liturgy of the Hours, their prayer book that included so many of the Psalms, the Pope decreed that in precatory, in precatory Psalms, which are these cursed Psalms, should be left out of the prayer book because of what he called psychological difficulty. Because of psychological difficulty, he said that 120 verses of the Psalter should be omitted. Three entire psalms and then cherry-picked verses out of several other psalms. This psalm is one of those cherry-picked ones. The Pope, when he decreed this, said that Psalm 79, if it's going to be included, should be in there without verses 7 or I mean 6 or 7 or 12. And when we go into those, you might see why he thought they were psychologically difficult. But here's my question. If, if the text is hard for us to take, should we just get a little sharpie and black out the text that we don't like? Should we, should we make this conform to our sensibilities? No, no, no. We bend ourselves to the word. We bow in worship to the God who gave us every word and thought every one of these words was important for us to hear. Amen? But it's not just popes. It's Protestants too. Uh, in, in the 1700s, in, in 17, I think I've got the year here, 1784, while writing the liturgy for the Methodist church, John Wesley took the, the Church of England's book of prayer, common book of prayer, and he said, I don't know that there's any book of prayer better for the church, but, he said, I am, I am leaving many psalms out and many parts of other psalms as being, and this is John Wesley's quote, highly improper for the mouths of the Christian congregation. So again, my question is, is that true? Would it be wrong for me as a pastor to tell this Christian congregation to read this with me? Is it wrong to, to have these words come out of my mouth in this Christian congregation? Now, some of you, as we dig in, you might say, well, they're not comfortable. But God is less concerned with our comfort. He's more concerned with our holiness. God is less concerned with our are just happy-go-lucky feelings, and he's more concerned with conforming us to the image of Christ. And so, whether it's popes or Protestants, we say, we're gonna look at every word, amen? We're gonna look at every word. And, and, and I don't say this lightly, but I can tell you there are many churches that you can sit in for years and years and never hear about wrath. There are many churches that you can sit in for years and years and never hear about the, the seriousness with which God looks at our sin. But the reason we go verse by verse through these books is because we don't want to skip anything that is for our good. See, some of you might have come to faith because somebody gave you an intellectual argument. I know one brother came to faith when, when he was told, hey, you can believe this, and here's the millions of reasons why. You can believe in the resurrection, and here's the, here's the many reasons why. But to grow in your Christian faith, you have to get to a point where you look at your sin and you hate it. You have to get to a point where you look at the holiness of God and you say, I do not want to be against him. I do not want to stand in enmity against this God. So we're going to look at this psalm. But, but let's look at those verses first that, that both the Pope and John Wesley wanted to have omitted. Look at verses 6 and 7 with me. The psalmist writes, the psalmist prays to God, pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. 
And then skip over to verses 10 and 12. Why should the nation say, where is their God? And look at these words. Let the avenging of the outward blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. And then in verse 12, return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors, the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. Can we say that? As Christians, can we say, I see an enemy of God, God, get him. Can we say, God, I've seen enough of this mockery of your name. I've seen enough of, of you being drugged through the mud of our culture. I, I've seen enough of my, my own character being uh, questioned because I really do believe in a holy and gracious God. Get them. Are we allowed to preach or to pray those kinds of things? Are we allowed to say those kinds of things? One, one writer who I heard, uh, well, well, read, uh, who was arguing the case for Wesley and the Pope, he pointed to another text. He pointed to a text in Matthew that might be familiar to you. It should be familiar to you. If it's not familiar to you, you should memorize this passage. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. The psalmist said, Lord, sevenfold, pour out sevenfold vengeance on them. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them. Okay? So, so does that negate Psalm 79? Some of you are shaking your head. Some of you are saying, you tell us, right? I want you to think deeply on this. I want you to dwell on this. I want you to say, okay, Scripture interprets Scripture. What should we do with this? Some of you might have thought already from the, the end of the, the, the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught in the next chapter of Matthew. At the end of that prayer, Jesus says in verse 14 and 15, if you will forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So again, sometimes people will point to these and say, so I don't think it's appropriate for Christian congregations to say Psalm 79. What do you think? I would encourage you to look at the beginning of that Lord's Prayer. At the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says to his disciples, he says to us in his word, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you don't know what that means, look in Psalm 79. If you don't know what it means for the Lord's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, look at Psalm 79. Because here's what happens when the Lord's kingdom comes. Every enemy of God, everyone who has taunted God with their lips or their lives will be destroyed. He will pour out that sevenfold vengeance upon those who have taunted him. Do you understand? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying, Lord, 
Once and for all, please take care of this sin. Once and for all, finally vanquish all of the enemies of your kingdom. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, that is what we're praying. So, how do we wrestle with that and the end of the prayer that says, and so forgive those who have sinned against you? If you forgive them, you are forgiven. In other words, if you forgive them, it's, it's an indication that you understand the forgiveness that you've been given, so you're just going to give the same grace that you've had poured into you. To ask God to forgive your enemies and for you to forgive your enemies is asking, Lord, just as you shed your, your son and your reign on me when I was a wicked sinner, I'm praying that you will do that for them too. But those who will not bend a knee to you I'm praying you take care of that. I pray that you take care of that. You're praying for their mercy, for for God's mercy to be poured on them, and if they will not reach out and take that mercy, mercy by faith, by the grace of God, then they've made their decision and let that condemnation come on them. Everybody likes to quote John 3, 16, right? So God so loved the world, his only begotten son so that anyone who believes in him should have everlasting life if you go on in John 3 he says that he Jesus has not come to condemn the world but they have been condemned by themselves already why because they will not believe we are begging God pour out your grace to another like you did to me But when we get to that final day, when his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, there will not be one Christian saying, that's not right. They they should have gotten mercy. If you're listening to me speak right now, God is extending mercy to you right now. And if you will not take it now, then he will not give it when he returns. If our knees will not bend to him as our king now, our knees will still bend on that final day. And we will still confess that he is the Lord. But instead of facing him as our savior on that final day, we'll face him as our judge. Again, you can't look in the New Testament and, and just explain away these ideas that you see in Psalm 79. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. This is how, how Paul ends his letter to the Corinthians. He says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Oh, Lord, come. Now, now we don't pit Jesus against Paul. Paul said what the Holy Spirit told him to say. And the Holy Spirit inspired him to say the words, if anyone has no love for the Lord, Let him be accursed. Oh, Lord, come. In Revelation chapter 6, there's martyrs in heaven talking to God. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, they, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. Listen to these words, just like in 79, just like in the song we sang, how long? How long for what? How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? To which the holy and reverent God said, don't talk like that. He didn't say that. Put a little bookmark in Revelation chapter 6 and read the next verse when you go home. He tells them, I'm going to pour out the vengeance when the last drop of the martyrs is spilled. Last drop of the martyrs' blood is spilled. So can we say what this psalm says? I mean, I shake my head. I, I, I'm, I'm one of those, those, those Christians who came to Christ very late in life. I was 24. Some of you are like, that's not late. Praise God, he got us whenever he got us. As a new Christian, and even as a Christian today, I shake my head when, when 
I don't know how to say this well, clowns that masquerade as preachers on TV are interviewed after natural disasters or interviewed after horrible occurrences, terrorist attacks and that sort of thing. And these clowns, they say, well, it happened because of the homosexuals. This happened because of their sins or their sins. Never once saying, my sin brought condemnation on this world. Every one of us since Adam has brought sin into this universe and has been breaking this universe. The only one who will fix it is God. I shake my head when these people, they, they, they look at everyone's sin but their own. This scripture says, listen, God is going to pour out his wrath, but this scripture also has another reason that a lot of people today don't want to see it. The second reason is that it's a reason that the Pope and, and Wesley probably didn't have a, a problem with the song, but today's Christians, today's churchgoers, today's society, today's non-believers, looking in, this is a reason that, that I think they will look at this psalm and say, that's not, that's not fit. That's psychologically inappropriate and troublesome. Look at verses five and verse eight. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? They're not asking how long, O Lord, are you gonna be angry at those sinners? They're saying, how long are you going to be angry with, with, with us, your people? Amen? And that's something our world does not want to hear. They want, they want the seeker-sensitive church. They want, they want to do everything to make everything easy and palatable for the ears of people who might walk into this room. And in so doing, they, they actually profane the name of God. Using the name of the Lord in vain is not just saying his name as a swear word. Using the name of the Lord in vain that says he just wants you to be happy, he's going to affirm everything you do, that is using his name in vain. He is angry at our sin. They ask, how long will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Look at verse 8. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are bought, brought very low. Now, a discerning reader might say, now, it's, it's weird. It seems hypocritical that they're saying, Lord, forgive us, but damn them. Are you bothered by that? Are you at least taken aback by that? Have you noticed that seems like a two-sided argument. It seems like I want good for me and bad for them. Well, here's, here's how a, a, a very old, dead theologian looked at this. He says, he says, when this psalm and other imprecatory psalms cry out for God's vengeance to be poured out, it's not so much a wish as a prediction. So again, it's, it's that idea that when the day of the Lord comes, when his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven, this is what's going to happen. So, so if you are sitting here, if you're listening to this and you are still an enemy of God, still someone who says, I don't need Jesus, then, then let these be a warning, a prediction, not us saying, I can't wait to see you go to hell. I mean, one of the worst things that I've ever seen are preachers who are really happy to talk about hell, who are really happy to talk about God's wrath on that group or that group. If there's never tears in your eyes when you think about the reality of hell and the people you know who are bound for that because they will not come to Christ, if there's not tears in your eyes, I don't know what kind of a person you are. We don't gloat, but we look at these as predictions. And, and if, you're, if you're listening and you're not a Christian, I'm begging you, be reconciled to God so that this is not yours. 
Another, another thing that this old dead theologian said about these verses is it's a reference to the justice of God and it is right. We should never apologize for God. Have you ever, have you ever had uh, something go on in your family and you, you went up after somebody blew up and you apologized and then that person came to you later and said, why did you apologize? I meant what I said. Anybody, anybody ever been there? I know some people's families, so I know you have. That's probably not a bad time to apologize. Like, I'm sorry, they were an idiot. I'm an idiot too sometimes. Please forgive us as a people, as a family, as the Richies or as the whoever's. But the difference is when God does something, when God says something, he doesn't need you to apologize for that. He doesn't need you to soften his words. The culture will do that enough, okay? He does not need his people to say, oh, but he didn't really mean that. His justice is real. And he doesn't need us to say, oh, he didn't mean it. He meant it. The reason I'm here is because he meant it and it was scary. Now, I wasn't scared out of hell. I've, I've talked to some pastors who are scared out of hell into heaven. But when I, even as a Christian who has already received his grace, saw the sin that I was committing, even as a Christian, I was like, Lord, I am sorry. You are holy. You've called me out of this. I don't want to live in this way anymore. Another thing that this old dead theologian said is that these verses could be an allegory for the removal of our enemy on that last day. So on the last day, if Jesus comes back today, before your heart stops beating, before you start, stop breathing, if Jesus comes back, second coming, we're all met up in glory with all the dead saints and, and all that's done, yes, his enemies will be vanquished, but your greatest enemy will also be vanquished. My greatest enemy, and if you're a Christian, your greatest enemy is not those sinners out there. It's that indwelling sin right here. In Romans 7, where Paul talks about, I know the right thing to do and I don't do it. I know what I shouldn't do and I do it anyway. Who is going to save me from this body of death? This psalm is a psalm you can pray against that indwelling sin and you can say, pour out your anger on that part of me that does not know you, purge it from me. Refine me like, like silver in fire. Do whatever it takes, Lord. Purge it from me. And this can be an allegory for that final day when you are no longer suffering with the indwelling sin. And here's, the, I think, the best reason that he has, this old dead theologian. And if you ever want to know why I don't name some of these guys, is sometimes if I say the old dead theologian's name you turn your mind off, right? Well, I heard that guy, no, just listen. The best reason I think he gave for why this psalm is good for Christians to, pre, or to, to, to read and to, to, to meditate on is it because it, it shows us that we can be emotionally honest with God. The only people I know who don't ever want vengeance are people who have never been hurt. If you look at this and say, I would never say something like that, then nobody's ever come against your spouse or your kids. Nobody's ever belittled you and, and stomped you into the ground. A lot of times in the Psalms, what you see in the Psalm is, is this just pouring out. This is what's really on my mind, Lord. And some people say, no, 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 you can't say that. Well, yes, you can. Jesus already knows what you have going on in your heart, whether you confess it to him or not. So when you see something like this, you can say, you know what? I want vengeance. But Lord, temper my, temper my desire for vengeance. Because the big deal, if you keep reading this psalm, is not that they've come against me. It's that they've taunted you. It's not, it's not that I'm, I'm wanting vengeance because of that sin. I, I, I want vengeance because 
your name is being belittled and people are not taking you seriously. If you look at this psalm, if you look at verses five and eight, when you look at your own sin, God needs you to know that he hates your sin. He hates my sin. He hates our sin. He hates the sin of this world. But he's also told us, don't presume on his mercy, but deal with the sin. So how do we do that? If you're a churchgoer, but a nominal Christian, and you're still walking in certain sins, how do I deal with that sin? If you're here and you're agnostic or atheist and you say, well, I don't even believe in a God up there, let alone these moral absolutes that you have. How do you deal with this sin? If you're, if you're a spiritual person, but not religious, I used to say that for years and years. Well, I'm spiritual. If there's something out there, maybe. But I'm not religious. All those Christians, those weirdos. How do you deal with your sin? First off, you need to see that God is dead serious about it. You need to see that God doesn't play with your sin. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses one through three, there's a story of a guy named Nadab and a guy named Abihu. They were sons of Aaron, and each took his censer in and put fire in it and laid the incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So back then, they had a tabernacle, and there was this most holy of places, and the priests were designed to, to bring uh, uh, sacrifices and burn incense and all this stuff for the, 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 the covering of the sins of the people and their own sins to the holy God. That's just the way God had laid it out. And these two said, you know what, he's prescribed how we should do it, but we're going to do it our way. We're going to bring this unauthorized fire in, and the fire came out from before the Lord, and it consumed them. It consumed Nadab and Abihu, and they died before the Lord. And then this is what Moses said to Aaron. Remember, it was Aaron's sons. It was Aaron's sons who, who were just dead because of false worship. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And look here, before all the people, I will be glorified. So that means, among God's people, I will be sanctified. I will be seen as holy. And among all the people, among everyone who's looking in on this Jewish nation, upon, upon now, all these people looking at Christians today, God does not want you to walk in sin or just stupidity because you are not only defaming the name maybe of yourself, maybe of your local church, but you're defaming the name of Christ. And you're giving them ammunition to mock. Now, are they still going to be judged for mocking God? Yes. Yes. But God says, stop giving them a reason. Stop giving them a reason to mock the Holy One of Israel. There was a, there was a, a preacher, a, a, a faith healer, and I'm putting quotes around faith healer, in Cameroon. And this faith healer, he said, well, if you come to me, I'll heal your COVID-19. God has given me the power to heal your COVID-19. Now, has God given people the power to heal before? Yes. Do I believe that the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit are gone? No. But you better be careful. If you're saying that God did this, you better be careful that you're talking for what God actually said and not just talking to draw a crowd. This man said, oh, bring your, your COVID patients to me and I'll cure them with a touch. And that pastor is dead of COVID-19. He's dead. Now you can say, well, God dealt with it, right? Nadab and Abihu, fire, false teacher, COVID. That's fine. But I just want to read to you comments from one of my atheist friends who saw that story. 
and used it for ammunition again against the God of Israel. He said on Facebook, if you believe in God, small g, and it brings you inner peace and it helps you to live your, live, live your past out and deal with all of the bad things, all good. He says, but if you believe someone that a book said lived 2,000 years ago and lives in the sky cares about you and your life, you need to get a grip. Death is final and coronavirus is proof that God doesn't listen or care if he is up there, says my atheist friend, to which I wept. Because A, he thinks that this fool who calls himself a faith healer is an accurate representation of the Christian life. But I also wept because this friend of mine who is railing against God is going to be dealt with. And every time I've reached out to him, it is nothing but mocking and scorn, and so I weep. I look at this, and I'm not ready to say for my friend, pour out your anger. Lord, I know it's going to be right if you do. I know it's going to be right if you stop his heart now for his sin against you. But I'm not ready to pray. I pray, Lord... Let your compassion arrest his heart now for the gospel like it did mine. Because I used to mock God so much worse than that friend on Facebook. I used to mock God and his people. My wife is home with with one of our sick children today. When she became a Christian, I was not a Christian. And when she said, hey, I'm getting baptized, I said, I don't want anything to do with that. You go do your thing. I'm not going to be a part of that. And I wouldn't mock her, but I would mock everyone she had as a brother and sister in Christ. So in turn, I was mocking even my own wife. Thank God he poured out his compassion on me. Thank God he did not count my sins against me. Thank God he, he picked this spoiled, obnoxious, degenerate up out of the mire and gave him new life. If you're a churchgoer, but you're still playing with sin, I pray that this psalm would would be a flashing neon sign saying you need to stop playing with that sin. God is not turning a blind eye to it. God is, not, God is not saying, oh, well, if you said you love Jesus, I don't care about all that wicked thing, all those wicked things you still do. God doesn't play with your sin. The people who said this, the, the, the writer of this psalm, had seen the temple destroyed, his city burned, all himself and all of his uh, countrymen taken into slavery. Those are God's people that God allowed that to happen to because he does not play with sin because it not only wrecks their lives, it also defames his name. Let this be, if you're a churchgoer still playing with your sin, let this be a call to you to repent before God gives you over to the consequences. Amen? I mean, I've been a pastor here, I talked about it last week, six years. And I've seen the consequences of sin burn down the lives of of people who claimed faith. I'm begging you, do not take your sin lightly. In love, he may allow you to face worldly consequences that will destroy everything you love. If you're here and you're not a Christian, please don't let the warnings of Psalm 79 fall in deaf ears. There is a day coming when verse 6 and verse 12 are going to devour you if you are not his. His anger will be poured out because you do not call on his name. 
he is going to return sevenfold into, the, into your lap for the taunts that you've taunted him with. And if you're here and you're a backslidden Christian, I don't say that word very often, but old church guys do. I'm going to use it. If you're here and, and you say, you know what? I have sinned. I hate my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I just can't seem to get there. Then I want this to be a prayer for you. I want this to be a confession and prayer for you so that you can, you can pray, verses 8 and 9. Look at this. If you're, if you're dealing with a particular sin that just can't seem to shake loose, let this be a prayer. Do not remember against me my former iniquity. Let that be your prayer. Lord, let it be a former iniquity. Let it be a thing of the past. Let this sin that has been tackling me and grappling with me and, and, and pulling me down, whether it's, whether it's lust or gossip or pride, whether it's some sort of selfishness or, or some, sort of, some sort of impurity, if it's something that no one else knows, Lord, let it be the past. Let it be past tense. Let it be a former iniquity. And let your compassion come speedily to meet me, to meet us as a family. For we, for I am brought very low by this sin. Help us, help me, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us, deliver me. Atone for our sins, atone for my sins. For your name's sake. Let this psalm point you to Jesus Christ. Let this psalm point you to Jesus Christ because, because at the cross we see this psalm realized. At the cross we see that God does not play with sin and he poured out every bit of wrath that you and I deserved for our sin. He did not say, it's okay. Everybody does that nowadays. He said, no, it deserves death. And he poured that death out on Jesus Christ for you and for me. Look to the cross. Let this prayer point you to the cross. Not only did he glorify his name at the cross, not only did he tell us that he's not ignoring our sin at the cross, but he also removed the wrath we deserved at the cross. You and I could not stand before a holy God without what Christ did on the cross. Because he took the wrath, he took the sin unto himself so that we could take on a righteous robe. If that can be your prayer, and I would encourage you, Christian, if you're here, or, or non-Christian, you're saying, you know what, I'm ready, I want to do this, I would encourage you to pray this prayer with another Christian. Now, we're not Roman Catholic, I'm not a priest, we don't have a little box somewhere where you can pray to me and me have, give you absolution, right? You're not confessing to me because you need me to forgive you. But the book of James does make it clear that, that a prayer to another Christian, a, a, a word to another Christian is saying, this is where I have sinned, it is freeing to us. It is, it is liberation to us if we can confess to another Christian. Not because we need their absolution, but because we need to say these words out loud. If you've confessed and confessed and confessed your sin to God, but you've never told a friend, I'm probably, I'm, I'm not saying 100%, 99.9% of the time, that's a sin you're gonna keep struggling with. God gave us his word, God gave us his spirit, and God gave us his people. So that if you're struggling with a sin, you need to confess it to a brother or a sister who you trust to help you walk out of that sin, Amen. This is what we're called to do. And then, I'm ending here, verse 13. If we, can, if we can make this our prayer, Lord, atone for my sin, for your name's sake. Take on my sin. I believe that you took on my sin at that cross. I believe that the wrath that I deserved was poured out. I believe that on the other side of the cross, I walk a free man. You walk a free man or a free woman. I walk in freedom because of what you've done. I'm confessing it to a, to a brother or a sister so that they can help me to, to walk in newness of life, so that they can hold me accountable, so that they can, they can uh, help do the work of sanctification that God has given them to do in my life. If you can do that, then you can make, verse 13, your 
your way of life from here on out. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Are you having trouble recounting his praise? Confess to God. Don't hide from your sin. Confess your sin. Thank him for his compassion and walk in newness of life. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what you've done for me. Thank you for what you have saved me from. Thank you for the work that you continue to do as you, as you use the gospel as both a, a scrubbing pad on my heart, but also the salve, the ointment that heals my heart. Father, thank you for what you have done and are doing in the lives of these believers who are listening today. Lord, thank you for working in the hearts of those who were far from you, who were enemies of yours, but now are yours. Thank you for giving them into this family. Thank you for allowing us to call them brothers and sisters. Thank you for the adoption of sons into your family. Lord, I pray that even today you would bring another one. Even today you would bring more into your family. Lord, if there's someone who is, who is not yet a believer, I pray that you would give them the boldness to come talk to me after this service so that we can talk about those next steps in faith. Because, Lord, you didn't call us to make converts. You called us to make disciples. And we want every one of us to grow in the ways of Christ. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people say, amen, amen. From the mouth of babes. You should learn something from Elena.